Um, so we have a couple of questions in so far. Um, if people want to keep submitting those questions, that would be great. But the first one came through from Veronica May. How much effect can we have if we choose our banks more wisely? Does your organization suggest the best ones? Thanks for that question. Um, it's a great question. We don't actually suggest, we don't have an official policy on that, of positive money. There are organizations that work on that. Um, I would recommend looking at the website of Switch It UK um, for banking and Make My Money Matter, which looks specifically at divesting your pension funds. So those two organizations would definitely have some great suggestions on that. Um, yeah, I would say it absolutely has an effect. I think consumer pressure is a really important part of this. Um, I think the only risk is that it becomes the sole focus of kind of campaigning energy when what we really need is this kind of macro level pressure um, for, you know, not only individual banks to be targeted, but actually for the Bank of England and the regulators to be under pressure to get the whole system under control. So that would be my my answer on that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I hope that answers your question, Veronica May. Um, our second question is from Sabine. Um, recently watched Bank of Dave, wondering if other initiatives like that are underway. Yeah, I've heard a lot about this film, but I haven't actually seen it yet. <laughs> So I can't comment on the film. Um, people said that it's a great example of kind of, yeah, had the impossibility of, of, you know, creating a bank outside of our very concentrated banking ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I'm sure lots of important lessons on that, on that there. Um, but I think, you know, the, the thing, the, the banking models that are really interesting that we have um, so few of in this country are the ones that I mentioned around kind of stakeholder banking, credit unions that are not designed to you know have huge investment banking arms and and finance lots of speculative activity but actually to um really create change and organize resources in a community so um yeah the uk is particularly bad on that front but i think that's what we need to see more of in the future yeah highly recommend watching that one it is uh really interesting in the insights that it gives, but also really quite entertaining as well. Um, our next question is from Duncan. Um, and Petit points at the certainty of capital controls at borders. Do you think we need related reform? Hmm, I'm not sure I understand this question fully. Is would Duncan mind elaborating on that? Maybe. Uh, Duncan, if I find you in the list and unmute you, do you want to uh, clarify for us? <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Uh, yes. Um. Yes, and Petaphor, and it's really. Uh, she hints, perhaps, uh, suggests, perhaps, uh, the importance of capital controls uh, to stop the free flow of, uh, well, it's a prejudicial term, but oligarchical sort of cash or uh, walls of corporate cash sloshing around the international system in order to be able to uh, really organize ourselves within our own national units. Um, I wonder whether um, our lovely speaker has got a view on the importance of capital controls at borders, uh, because it seems to me rather central uh, in terms of trying to start exercising democratic control over footloose finance. Thanks. I think he's a DM member. Oh, I think you're not on mute, Alicia. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks for the thanks for the question, Duncan. That's not something I've that we've particularly um that we've done much thinking about, to be honest, at positive money, but I think that's a really interesting point. Um yeah, I mean the as climate change is a global issue and so is the international financial system, 
reform um, a global issue. So we definitely need a kind of joined up approach uh, with other countries on, on some of these issues. Um, and yeah, I guess I could make a, this is, I know this is not an answer to your question, but a related point is about the um, international flow of capital into um, low income and emerging markets, uh, which is also the threat of that at the moment is that it's going to become a bit basically a way of bolstering new kind of green markets and basically a way of extracting more resource from the global south to the global north. So I think it's really important that we have a kind of grant based approach to financing the low, the low, the low carbon economy in, in the global south as well. And don't just use it as a way of kind of expanding the current financial order with the global south, uh, with the global north of the center. But yeah, interesting question about capital controls as well. Thank you very much for that. Uh, our next question is in from Joycelyn and John. We wonder how much of the bank's activities were done under the cover of the pandemic? Uh, is that in terms of banks financing of environment of unsustainable activity? <laughs> yeah, f f fossil fuels and um, what you said earlier in your earlier comments about what they're doing, uh, uh, you know, undercover, so to speak, um, in terms of climate change and supporting big businesses who are against what we're thinking of this evening. Does that help? Yeah, I mean, the the information that's publicly available about um, UK banks financing of fossil fuels in this country and around the world um, shows a pretty steady trend, you know, at, at a level or even upwards it's in the last in the last five years since the or six years since the Paris Agreement. Um, so I don't think there was a huge um, uptick around the pandemic. I think what was interesting in the pandemic was the government's approach to um, bailout schemes, which was something that uh, we worked on at Positive Money. So the, the Bank the bank of England basically stepping in to give, uh, as I mentioned, I think low cost loans and basically support, liquidity support in a time of crisis. Um, and what we were saying about that is that we need, if public money is being used um, to cover private sector risk, we need conditions to be attached to those bailout schemes so that there is, so that there is actually a public benefit to the public money being used in that way. So we need, for example, if there's uh, you know, a bailout fund that's supporting big corporations, we need conditions attached to those schemes that say um, those companies need to be writing transition plans, they need to be uh, committing to um, environmental targets and decarbonisation. Um, so we have see we have made some progress on that, and actually, Bank of England um, bailout schemes uh, more recently, like the energy markets finance financing scheme, they've all got really lovely, um, exciting names. These schemes, but we actually did have environmental conditions attached to it. So we've seen a bit of a shift in thinking um, around that since the pandemic, which is a good thing. Brilliant. Thanks, Anna. Um, there are no more questions in the Q&A. Does, does anyone have any other questions or do any of our panellists uh, would like to take this opportunity to ask a question? Alicia, did I, did I see your hand go up there? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wondered um, in the future whether uh, the carbon costs would actually be more relevant to decisions than the money. It, it always seems to be we can't afford it, but in 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 the future, whether in fact um, working within carbon budgets um, and the purpose of work to reduce carbon will be uh, more influential than the amount of money spent. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting um, way of putting it. I mean. I guess there's always arguments framed in terms of GDP that also make the same argument that, you know, the costs of not acting fast, um, you know, are much higher than the, the than the costs, um, than the cost of acting and, and mitigating the worst impacts of climate change. 
but it's it's true what you're saying we also need to be thinking about what are we measuring what are the the indicators of economic success that we're working to um so we also do some work on the idea of a well-being economy you know what would it look like if the treasury and the office for national statistics were publishing indicators on human well-being and health and all sorts of other things and actually targeting treasury policy to to you know maximize those indicators um so yeah definitely de-emphasizing gdp um, and kind of traditional cost benefit analysis is a really important part of this as well thank you brilliant Thanks, and and I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, we've not had any more questions pop up, so if none of our other panelists would like to ask a question, I think we will draw your section to all. Oh, we've had one dive in at the last minute. Veronica May back. What do you think are the chances of ever moving away from GDP? Um. I would say not very high right now in the UK. Um, I think there are very strong movements uh, towards something like a well-being economy in other parts of the world. So there's actually a well-being economy alliance of governments that are thinking along those lines. Um, I think Scotland is a member, New Zealand, um, yeah, kind of a strange mixture of countries that are, that are committed to, to thinking about that. Um, but yeah, unfortunately at the moment on you know, the two major parties in the UK are completely obsessed with GDP growth. Um, even with the Labour Party having talked previously about kind of green prosperity and what would green prosperity look like across regions of the UK um, without being so obsessed with kind of GDP growth, which is, you know, as, as we all know, a really bad indicator of actually um, people's quality of life. So, so yeah, I think the outlook is not that great right, right now in the UK, but hopefully there's kind of movement in other parts of the world that will have a knock-on effect once people see um, the benefits of, of, of thinking that way. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, and Peter has also just jumped in. Do you think, uh, so do you look at environmental discounting as a key factor in green financing, governments slash people's preference for short term instead of long term? Yeah, I think that's I think that's really important. I think, um, yeah, I mean, the whole legal and economic system is set up for financial institutions to be making decisions, you know, that revolve around maximizing shareholder profits in the short term. Um, I think one risk uh, that we often see is that the state comes in as a way of basically de-risking private finance so basically taking socializing the risks like taking um taking on the risks into the public sector and then enabling the private sector to make all the profits off what are essentially risk-free activities so that's a really <laughs> uh lazy form of, of sort of green finance that we often see in the world um and one that really kind of hollows out the the state in the public and the public sector so um yeah, I think a genuine approach to to greening the financial system needs to think really carefully about what the role of the public and private sectors are and make sure that the, that the public sector has a much more active role um, in delivering yeah, more democratic change. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I have just posted a couple of links in the chat um, from Positive Money, uh, one to the Green Financing Report and one to the Green Central Banking Scorecard that may be of interest. Um, but if there are no more questions, we are running bang on time, which is wonderful. Um, so thank you so much, Anna. Um, your Twitter details are of both yourself and Positive Money are in the chat. And you've said that if uh, anyone wants to get in touch, they should feel free to do so. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, we know you've got to get off now. Um, but yeah, really appreciate it and uh, all of your insights and uh, look forward to you being part of the conversation going forward. <laughs>